The Swiss resort of Davos, where the movers and shakers from the world of politics, business and culture gather for their annual get-together at the World Economic Forum. Our topic in this BBC World News debate is fake news and the challenges and threats it presents to politics and societies. From influencing voters to fostering divisions and fueling prejudice, there are growing calls for something to be done. The online giants like Google and Facebook say they're trying to prevent fake news spreading on their sites. But is it too late to stop the rot? Welcome to the World Economic Forum in Davos for our debate on fake news. It is one of the buzzwords of our time because it is such a significant phenomenon of the internet age. Let me tell you who's on our panel. So, Jimmy Wales, co-founder of Wikipedia, who's on a mission to fight fake news with the launch of Wiki Tribune. Joseph Kahn is managing editor of the New York Times that's seen its circulation shoot up. It was founded in 1851 and has received more than 120 Pulitzer Prizes for its journalism. Annabel Keener, deputy editor-in-chief of RT, the Kremlin-backed television network, formerly known as Russia Today, and Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, chairman of the Pakistan People's Party. He's the son of the former prime minister, Benazir Bhutto, assassinated 10 years ago. Welcome to our panel, and of course, to you watching and listening around the world on TV, radio, and online. Now, you know, first I asked our colleagues um, on the BBC's technology programme, Click, to take a look at what fake news is and how it's becoming more and more sophisticated. The fake news. Fake news. Fake news. This is fake news. A little bit of fake news. Fake news. You are fake news. Fake news. Everyone's using the term these days. And with good reason. While President Trump may have helped put the term in the dictionary, the rest of the world has been struggling to separate fact from fiction. That was fake. The headline was, this is how Islamic society looked like and we are heading to this. That was fake. The most grotesque stomach churning videos. That's fake too. The problem is, it now seems to mean everything from actual lies to just something you don't agree with. So just how do we sort fact from fiction, opinion from satire, and from highly skewed and misleading headlines? Tech giants like Facebook, Twitter and Google have spent a year wrestling with the problem. But in a world driven by likes, clicks and attention, do they have what it takes to fight the fakes? It could be that one reason it's so hard to stop this stuff is that there's big money to be made in creating it. This was for a couple of years that I did it. I was so much younger. A lot of fake news that's being written is just by regular people that are sitting down on their computers that have learned this formula, scandalous title uh, plus false information equals profit. Once upon a time, even a 13-year-old could do this. One thing is certain. Fake news is a lot easier to make and share than it is to find and debunk. And recognising fake news could be about to get even harder. New technology could soon make us question not just what we read, but everything we see and hear. And you can't get charged more just for being a woman. From stealing our faces to mimicking our voices. I am not a robot. My intonation is always different. What's real? has never been so unclear. Fact-checking organizations and technologists are working to identify and flag fake news. Researchers and politicians are starting to investigate its impact. And we're all starting to become more aware of the power it can have. Russia is seeking to weaponize information, deploying its state-run media organizations to plant fake stories and photoshopped images in an attempt to sow discord in the West and undermine our institutions. Is it too little, too late? Or is this just the start of a high-tech 
fake news arms race. Quick question to all of you. <clears throat> How useful the term is fake news? Joe Kahn. Well, it's a useful term in, in the sense, as your clip points out, uh, the phenomenon of maliciously created false information uh, for political or economic purposes is an ongoing and very serious threat uh, when news and information is distributed so widely on technology platforms. Uh, Bill Owen, is it a useful term, fake news, catch all phrase? Uh, you know, I'm not so sure, Zainab, because I feel that obviously misinformation, propaganda, disinformation um, have been long-standing components of information mm. warfare. Uh, fake news has recently gained prominence vis-a-vis uh, -vis the American election, mm -hmm. uh, but as uh, we saw in that clip, when politicians use it as a catch-all phrase to cover uh, political spin, stuff they don't like, then it, then it gets murky. Annabelle Kina. I think the term is absolutely toxic because it muddles the debate um, and just the public discourse about accuracy and factuality in information. Um, it is um, also, it, we see it weaponized by public figures, but also by media organizations as a way to silence dissenting voices, as a way to avoid uh, answering to any kind of criticism. And um, at the very end, it is harmful to the actual prob problem that we're trying to solve here. <clears throat> okay, Jimmy Wells, I mean, you know, we put fabricated evidence into fake news and news that simply people don't like. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do think that's a problem, and I, I'm surprised that I agree with Annabelle, except the one thing I would add to that is we should distinguish between fake news generated by teenagers and things like that, and there are actually better terms for propaganda, for something like RT, uh, and muddling those two together is really a huge mistake. All right. Uh, uh, Joe Kahn from the New York Times, you were the recipient of a fake news award, a newspaper was yes. from the White House. And, you know, being treated as a bit of a joke and uh, people are making, you know, playing with it and so on. Is it a joke? Well, that's... Uh, President Trump's definition of fake news is <clears throat> the real problem with fake news, which is, which is that his accusation of fake news is fundamentally fake. Uh, <laughs> there... The, the problem with fake news is not journalism, which sometimes makes errors in the, in the process of reporting and writing and then promptly corrects itself. Good journalistic organizations own up to their errors. Every single one of the awards that president gave, uh, the president gave out to fake news media were media organizations that made factual errors and corrected them. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is the definition of good journalistic practice. Calling it fake news is an all-purpose smear, which has made the term, as, as people said in the clip, a weaponized term sure. to try to... But you're wearing as a bit of badge of honor, are you? I got a fake news award from the White House. Why not? Okay. I wish we had more than one, quite uh, below, below, will, <laughs> below will Buto. <clears throat> I mean, that's one side of fake news, but actually in your part of the world, when fake news is disseminated on WhatsApp or whatever medium order, it can have actually rather dangerous consequences. I, I mean, I think that it can have dangerous consequences everywhere. Uh, I think what we were referring to with President Trump is particularly concerning and dangerous, not because it's funny he's handing out fake news support and, and he's, you're absolutely correct, they've all been uh, corrected. The point is to have uh, the leader of a democratic country demonizing the press in such a way is what concerns me. Uh, coming from a fragile democracy, uh, from a political party in a country who's fought for Pakistan to be a democracy, uh, I'm concerned both with the use by politicians of this term to sort of demonize the press, and on the other side... Does that uh, go on in Pakistan, then? I mean, who's oh, behind yeah, fake news in Pakistan? Oh, well yep. before Trump. I won't take the yep. politician's name. Uh, but attacking and demonizing the media, uh, re repeatedly repeating false fiction on a mass scale, that's, that's sort of... And who else is behind it in Pakistan? Okay, so I think that, as with everywhere else, it's, uh, there's no uh, concrete uh, way to answer that question. 
Uh, yes, politicians are behind it. News media in, in my country and in other parts of the developing world are far more commercialized, are uh, owned by big business interests who aren't limited in, uh, in, in the way it is in the UK, that you can't have a television sure. station uh, and, and a yeah. newspaper. They push out their commercial interests. So non-traditional platforms um, can actually be a source of rather credible news. So a lot of, um, a lot of actors involved there. Yeah. Um, Jimmy Wells, Wikipedia is part of the digital explosion, of course, but you are, if I could sort of put it delicately, also part of the kind of fake news problem, because there are a lot of inaccuracies, aren't there? There are a lot of inaccuracies on Wikipedia. Well, there, there, of course, there are a lot of inaccuracies in everything, but uh, the thing about Wikipedia is that we are diligently and passionately committed to getting it right. And so uh, we have very strong standards about reliable sources. Uh, we have a very open uh, policy of correcting any mistakes that come into us. Of course, uh, doing serious research, doing serious journalism inherently involves making mistakes from time to time. Mm -hmm. But the key is you just have to try to get it right. And I think that's fundamental. And this is very and different. And there there's from, no malicious or malevolent intent behind I think that inaccuracy. I think that's really important, yeah. yeah. And also, you know, a lot of the fake news problem, fake news that gets circulated on social media and so forth, doesn't make it into Wikipedia because the Wikipedia community are very sophisticated about evaluating sources. And so they would see uh, fake news from uh, teenagers in Macedonia or whatever the classic example is, and they would recognize immediately, that's not a real newspaper. I've never mm. heard of that. They check around, and it doesn't make it into mm. Wikipedia. Annabelle Kino, we heard Theresa May in our short film there accusing Russia and of weaponizing information. And as you know, there are so many accusations against RT from various sources. I know you'll say it's not, not the case, but, you know, NATO, President Emmanuel Macron of France, um, Theresa May, the German government, the American government, they all say Russia as a state actor is a perpetrator of fake news and it uses stations such as RT. Well, those accusations, and I'm going to speak specifically about RT because a lot of them are very directly um, addressed to us. Those accusations are false. They're demonstrably false. I'm glad that you brought up the statements by President Macron. Um, RT has actually been a target of false information spread about it. Th th throughout the campaign, the presidential campaign... So what, campaign, you're accusing President Macron of false, spreading false information well, his about campaign, RT? His campaign repeatedly has made claims that RT has spread false stories about their candidate. However, throughout the duration of the campaign or thereafter, they have failed to provide a single, a single example of such a new story. And now... Um, all right, but what, you see, know, there is. I know you. Will, I know you will say it, it, it's, they're all false, and but they come from so many, you know, quarters. Um, NATO, Russia. NATO say says it's been dealing with a significant increase in Russian propaganda and disinformation since 2014. Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg from Facebook has denounced Russia's fake news agency. I could really go on and on and on. And this so is part. Please, yeah. This is part of the problem that we're conflating. You, you know, terms like propaganda, misinformation, disinformation are notably much more subjective and vague than something like fake news. And they are used to dismiss and discredit any kind of dissenting, any kind of inconvenient uh, opinion or even just fact, uh, any kind of reporting. Um, but when presidential candidate or his team repeatedly and without evidence presents um, these kinds of accusations of fake news. And, you know, all the media in the U.S. and really the mainstream media in the West is very happy to point to any kind of statement... The uh, intelligence of, agencies of, Trump, of Germany but, and but France, again, all these countries have pre issue. provided We're the evidence. We're scrutinising differently statements by President Trump and we're not scrutinising accusations of fake news from President Macron at all. In all fact, right. there has been a single, single mainstream media outlet to call out to question the uh, Macron campaign and that has been Reuters and they could not... They did not receive a single example of a false story RT Jimmy, has provided. Jimmy Wales, you, are you satisfied with what you just heard? That complete um, and utter <laughs> denial and rejection there. Um, I mean, if you just... Uh, the, the evidence is from so many different places. So Columbia Journalism School uh, had a team of graduate students at uh, the project RT Watch, and they found multiple examples of completely uh, misrepresentation, false stories, uh, fake experts, uh, outright, you know, lies and... It's, I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. And so it's not really, that's not even an open question. And also, I think it's really important to understand that serious people don't say fake news is news I disagree with. And so it's not about silencing dissenting views. You don't see uh, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times when they disagree on an issue calling each other fake news. 
Um, it's about basic journalistic standards. Joe wants to come in here. Joe, go on. I, I was going to say, Zaina, that, that I think Anna's correct, and Jimmy mentioned this earlier on one point. There is a semantic distinction between propaganda or news with spin that is put out there by a state or by a news organization for some kind of political purpose or effect, which has a basis in fact, but is its fundamental purpose is to spin the facts for the purpose of Is that the case, though? So, I mean, President Emmanuel Macron said that, you know, that there were wild accusations about him having secret bank accounts yes. in the Caribbean I mean, and that I'm he was it's a secretly a homosexual and that kind of thing. There's no it's, basis it's, in it's, truth it, in that, there's, he said. There's a spectrum between propaganda and, and spin and totally false, maliciously created fake news. But that's news. what he's saying. Well, I'll tell you exactly what he said, OK, just to get this out there. <laughs> Emmanuel Macron said, Russia Today, he also mentioned the Sputnik website, have been agents of influence which on several occasions spread counter-truths about me personally and my campaign. They behaved like agents of influence and false propaganda. That's what he said. Take it up with him. Could I just We've to... tried. We have right. tried multiple okay. times. To you tried. Russia Today's defense for a second. Uh, absolutely, uh, politicians, media outlets, partisan media outlets push out agendas, etc. But let's not forget that WMDs in Iraq was also fake news. Theresa May says in that clip that Russian Today is uh, a state... Weaponizing information. Uh, yeah. Weaponizing information, yeah. fair enough. But they're also saying, she's saying that, it, you know, through state-sponsored media. We're sitting on a BBC platform that's state-sponsored in the UK. We have to be able uh, to yeah. sort of uh, see that when we're looking at it from their point of view, we don't seem to notice our own flaws and weaknesses uh, in the Western setup either. Nice try there, below one, Buto. <laughs> However, sorry. I have to say... The New, it, the New York Times, oh, no, I have to say, well, I can only tell you the what... The BBC, how do yes, you report WMDs in Iraq? Yeah, but we, when we get it wrong, we say that we After got something wrong. Yeah. In Iraq. But, but, but there's no equivalence argument. You know, the BBC, yes, you say RT is just a, a national broadcaster just like the BBC is. You know, BBC is subjected to... To, to independent, you know, a, 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 a regulator, Ofcom, As is RT. which is nothing to do with the, with the government. And the BBC regularly <laughs> makes reports and inv investigations which criticise the government. Absolutely. Do you so do that on RT? We absolutely do that on RT. We are regulated, actually, by Ofcom as well, um, all of our programming. Um, and uh, just as Joe was uh, describing and the process and of um, multiple times by Ofcom. less than the B than the BBC and never find like the BBC <laughs> has. Um, so this is but this is this is this is the problem. We don't, we we're make... moving the goalposts. We're constantly moving the goalposts. Something and this is the problem that errors that RT has made. And of course, we've made errors in our reporting and we've addressed them. We've corrected. We've issued uh, clarifications to we've informed our audience. But when it comes to RT or other alternative voices, legitimate alternative voices, in the news media, those kinds of accusations become a way of to summarily misrepresent the nature of what we do. Let's take a question, actually. We have got uh, Iman Usman from Indonesia, the most populous Muslim nation in the world, of course, and you work in um, mm. online education. Your question, please. Many politicians have overused digital media uh, for a short-term benefit of winning the election. And this led to the explosion of fake news, which led to um, the divisions uh, within those communities. So my question to the panel is that how does, um, how much danger does fake news poses to democracy? There was a Gallup poll just this month saying that 73% of Americans believe that fake news is a threat to democracy. Joe, quickly on I that I think one. it is. I, I think I'd, I'd twist the question a little bit. I think that the hyper-partisanship in politics, not just in the United States, but around the world, uh, produces the fake news phenomenon as opposed to fake news producing hyperpartisanship. We are in an environment where people are lead identity-based political lives, where they are affiliating with certain news and information based on its political value, based on the way political parties are using it. I don't think fake news is the cause of the problem to democracy. I think that the proliferation of fake news is one of the most important symptoms of a decline in sort of shared, shared values and shared sense of truth, quite honestly.
Annabel Keener, threat to democracy and politics. Well, I agree with you, Joe, that any kind of false information has uh, a potential to negatively influence uh, not just political processes, but any kind of public discourse <coughs> overall. Um, however, there have already been several studies uh, in uh, the US and Europe that show that even though people might be exposed to, uh, to fake news, well, to uh, false stories and false information, uh, in, uh, in the grand scheme of things, they still make uh, their decisions, their political decisions, on the basis of um, of factual information, of factual reporting, which is encouraging for all of us. That doesn't mean that we should be complacent, um, but I think this is where kind of the upside lies in the situation. Jimmy Wales, I mean, a, a report on 28 countries by the Edelman Trust showed that 65% of people get their news online or via apps like WhatsApp and so on. So the potential for mm. fake news wreaking havoc is huge, isn't it? It, it is huge. I, actually, one of the encouraging things from that uh, trust barometer survey was that people's trust in news coming from social media has declined substantially in the last year, which means that people are beginning to be aware of the problem that something that just flows by you in social media may not be valid and that maybe you need to turn to a better source. I mean, that's the point, isn't it? I mean, that's a very good point. Do people really believe that this story about, you know, the Pope, Pope Francis endorsing Donald Trump as a candidate is true? That was one of the ones given out by the Macedonian teenagers. I mean, people are, are intelligent. They kind of think, oh, Pope Francis, you know, supports migration, left of centre and so on. I mean, this is not really going to be accurate. So should we credit people with more intelligence that they're not so susceptible to fake More than news? a million people shared that particular item of fake news on Facebook shared it in their own feed. So more than a million people thought it was interesting enough But did they believe it? They might just share it. It's but... unclear, you don't know. But yeah. in most cases, when people share, it's something that they want their friends to see. It's something that they want their friends and community to, sh to see and understand. Do you think that's right, Jimmy? I mean, you know, if people yeah. share, do you think that means that they believe that story is true? Um, yeah, or, or they, they think it's either alarming enough or confirming enough of something they feel at yeah. that moment to, to pass along. Um, how much do they even bother reading it? How much do they just vaguely go away with the notion? I mean, one of the things that's, I think, really hard for people who are uh, news junkies to keep in mind is that, you know, we immediately see that and we say, well, that's ludicrous. There's no yeah. way the Pope endorsed Trump. But people who are not uh, avid news consumers, they're very naive about the news, uh, which, by the way, I think in free societies, people have the right, right. to not be interested in news. However, when they do get some information, it should be quality. They also have a right to quality information. Annabelle Kina? I think we have to look at why they're compelled to read and to share those stories in, in the first place. And I think the big reason for that is that for uh, many years, if not decades, the, a, lot, a large part of uh, the audience um, in the US and Europe felt underserved by their own news media and because they didn't see that as reflecting their reality. And so they would turn to alternative voices, some legitimate and responsible and accountable like RT, but others are not. And until the mainstream media, what Bartir versus the mainstream media, takes a um, more critical look at why this kind of environment was created in the first place. And by the way, Joe, this, even uh, reporters and columnists uh, like Jim Burdenberg from the New York Times itself have reflected on that in the wake of the Brexit vote and the US election. Until there is a very honest effort to address this issue and to not discourage legitimate alternative voices from the news discourse, that, that a problem will persist. Annabelle Kina brings up a very good point for the mainstream media. It's a challenge, really, that um, citizens and readers go where they want, and it's because the mainstream media failed to give the citizens and the readers what they wanted. So you also do uh, share some of that uh, responsibility. Uh, I think there, there's, we, we have a mission to try to reach as many people as we can with our journalism, but I think we have to understand that a large part of the reading public wants information that is confirming of their biases and the political beliefs. And the New York Times and the BBC are not committed to providing them with information to confirm their biases. We are committed to providing them with journalism. So that in a hyper-partisan environment, you will have people constantly search for sources of news and information that confirm their prior political beliefs. 
they will often fail to find that in the most credible news media, and they will seek it out elsewhere. But it's not our responsibility but, to provide them with right. fake or misleading news simply to confirm their political all bias. All right, but the mainstream media is also, people say, you know, responsible in the, in the sense that there has been a failure in regulation of standards in the mainstream media, which kind of helped the proliferation of fake news. I guess I would not agree with that. Not I, for the New York Times, but... Well, I can, you know, I, I can't speak for every element of the mainstream media. I think the mainstream media, for the most part, does its best to try to improve itself. It makes mistakes over time. The journalistic process is inherently imperfect, but we are committed to fact-based, you know, well-reported journalism. That is the way that we try to get our audience. We do have a very substantial audience, but you can't look at the entire world of news and information right. and blame the proliferation of partisan biased view that circulates online on a failure by mainstream media. All right, let's go to the audience because there's another question from Rebecca McKinnon, who's from the United States, an advocate for digital freedom of expression and privacy. Your question briefly, please, Rebecca. Sure. Uh, my question relates to the previous question, but it deals with business models and democracy. Um, we know now from, from studies of what has happened over the past year that disinformation campaigns appearing on social media were really the result of people very skillfully using the features and services that social media companies, Facebook and others, provide to advertisers and digital marketers. Um, so, so the question is, is the over-dependence of our media ecosystem on advertising, and particularly advertising technology that tracks people all over the internet and enables very targeting, targeted messaging to specific types of people. To what extent is that an existential right. threat to the democratic discourse? Well, we've talked about the democratic discourse. So let's just keep with, um, do we need to rework the business model? Because that's what the Macedonian kids did, didn't it? They were trying to get absolutely. lots of hits so that they could get advertising. Yeah, absolutely. So the- Jimmy the, Wales. The, yeah, the advertising only business model has been incredibly destructive for journalism. Uh, one of the most encouraging signs that I've seen uh, in the last couple of years is the incredible surge in uh, digital-only subscriptions to the New York Times um, and other quality papers. People are finally understanding, hey, actually, we need to pay for quality journalism. The problem with, uh, particularly when we have this advertising technology, everywhere I go on the internet, I see the same ads. I see ads for boats, because I like boats. Uh, and in the old days, you might say, I want to sell boats. I'm looking for 50-year-old men in some kind of midlife crisis who want to buy a boat because uh, that's who buys boats. And you would think, oh, they read the New York Times and the Guardian and the FT and the Wall Street Journal and you advertise with them. Now, the ads can be anywhere. I can be on a message board, I can be on Reddit, I can be on a spammy website, uh, I can be anywhere and I'll see the same ads, which means that the serious players here are now competing head to head in a really direct way for ad dollars, for clicks, yeah. which puts the wrong incentives in front of everybody. So we need to and rework the business model. We need model. to rework the business model. Advertising as a piece of the business model is fine, but in this environment with this highly um, automated advertising ecosystem, journalism can't compete right. if it's just about raw, raw clicks, clicks, right. clicks. Need to rework the business model Absolutely. below what I would agree. Say? I think that not only fake news for many reasons, but the business model uh, is a fundamental threat. Uh, to democracy and to media in a, in a country like Pakistan in particular. I mean, that's where I know more examples of. Um, so big business houses uh, control uh, the majority of media in Pakistan, all media in Pakistan, that, that dominates all the space, dominates all the narrative. And they don't hesitate to print fictional news, uh, to run fictional news on their electronic uh, media. And the quality of journalism in Pakistan, and let me tell you, we have some of the best journalists in Pakistan. Mm. We've managed to stave off three military dictatorships with the help of some of the most bravest journalists, and they're, they're in my country. But with this commercialization, with this, uh, with less with the ads, but just sort of the big industries in Pakistan who have the money and the government doling out cash, um, what's produced in, on, on television is more acting and spin and propaganda. So you think that there's more sensationalism Absolutely. in the news Absolutely, and business. the poor, credible journalists who for all their lives do this can barely make ends meet aren't getting the same packages at these done-up actors who read off the mm. teleprompter. Annabelle Kina. I think it's part of the problem, but it is not uh, the majority of the problem. Uh, in my view, uh, false information is just as harmful if it's created and distributed for just for fun or for the purpose of political interference as it is when people are trying to make money off of it. Um, 
the issue again is how can we inoculate the audience against this kind of information regardless of the means through which it is distributed and promoted. I mean, this really brings up the issue when it comes uh, about, you know, the likes of Twitter, Facebook and Google. Are they publishers or are they platforms? Jimmy Wells, you're nodding, so um, come to you. No, I, I, think it's, I think it's super interesting what Facebook is doing. I think we, we don't know yet what that will mean exactly. Uh, on the one hand, I think uh, serious publishers should be happy that maybe uh, it's not all about uh, clickbaity headlines that get traction on social media. On the other hand, a lot of publishers are worried about if there's a decline in traffic from Facebook, that's meaningful, um, certainly in the short run. Mm. So, I, but I do think that the platforms really do need to think and reflect on the, the role of the information that they're providing to consumers, and not just from a public spirited motive, although I hope they take that into account, but also just from a, a quality of user experience. If people begin to feel like, you know what, actually I find that I go on Facebook or I go on Twitter and I get all these nonsense news stories that I don't even know are true or not, I don't really wanna do that. Uh, that's not what I want Facebook for. Then they'll stop using Facebook um, as much and they'll say, I just want a service where I can look at photos from my friend's kids and they all move to Instagram, which I think Facebook owns. Um, but <laughs> the point is, um, I, I think that the, the, the platforms need to take this seriously. Um, and so I, you and think I, they, I, they've not been doing enough I think, um, I think that they have not been doing enough right, to the yeah. extent that their brands are being tarnished. Um, but you refer to them as platforms because th that's their fear of being seen as publishers, as I said, because then they're subjected to different rules. Do you, you think they are just platforms? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, think, I think it would be, if I want to uh, share something with a friend um, on Twitter or on Facebook, uh, I don't think it's, it's fair in any way to assume that Facebook is responsible for that content. Joe Kahn? Facebook are absolutely determined not to be reclassified uh, uh, in the business ecosystem as a publisher that, that really takes responsibility for what all of its two billion users around the world post, the accuracy of it, the, the, you know, the reliability of that information. They would essentially need to hire every available human being in the world to police <laughs> that content in order to have any assurance the way you know, a good publisher would, mm -hmm. that what they're, what they're publishing on that platform meets their standards. So it's literally impossible for the Facebook business model to become a publisher business model. At the same time, they're feeling some of the pressure that publishers feel because they do feel a certain sense of responsibility for the most malicious fake news that may have an impact on the political debate. I think that explains why Mark Zuckerberg announced this change in their algorithm. To some extent, they're stepping back from trying to be or even present themselves as a primary provider of news. It doesn't mean news won't show up on the platform, but they want to be a social media site, not a primary source for people to consume news and information. But they could see publishing. a real drop in their income as a result if they do rework their business they model. Have they could even disappear they, conceivably, couldn't they? That seems unlikely, but, right. but, the, but, but I do think that they could become a somewhat less significant source of news and information, and they would not, at least according to what they're telling us, be that reluctant to be viewed as a less significant uh, source of news and information. Bilal will be too. Uh, what has this Facebook's recent decision on this, how has that impacted publications like the New York Times? Because surely sort of uh, when this stuff is being promoted actively on Facebook, that would drive traffic to uh, organizations. We're, we're watching it closely, we're concerned. We think that it will impact us somewhat less than the ecosystem of true, you know, sort of fake news providers that Rebecca was describing who are looking for clickbaity returns uh, from advertisers. That was never our business. Mm. Uh, we never got enough revenue from Facebook to support the gathering and the reporting and publishing of real news mm. anyway. Annabelle Keener on this issue of the business model, time to rework it. Well, I think the uh, one danger that we need to avoid when uh, discussing the role of these platforms is to not put uh, three um, American companies, three platforms essentially in the positions of global censors of news. Um, obviously, I have absolutely no idea when patently false information uh, is going to be taken out of the discourse, and I hope that this happens because it's harmful for all of us. But uh, they should not be deciding that one point of view is more valid than the other. Then you know, Washington Post should be promoted over the New York Times, over BBC, over Franz Van Katter, over RT, when it's based, when it's discussing uh, and publishing legitimate reporting. 
That's a very valid point. I mean, you talked about, Joe said, Joe Khan said, you know, you just can't have enough fact checkers to just, you know, deal with the volume of news and trying to see what's fake and what isn't. I think there's a the temptation internet. to make them de facto censors. Yeah. But so, so what, what are the solutions? You've got this idea of Wiki um, Tribune. Yeah, well, I don't, uh, Wiki Tribune is, is my effort to play a small part in, in helping think this thing through. Uh, the idea I have is to say, look, we know that communities uh, can do incredible positive work. And we see that at Wikipedia. Of course, it's not perfect, but it's great people trying really hard to get it right. And I want to see if we can bring in a Wiki-style community, pair them with paid professional journalists to do something new in the space of news. And So you kind of get successful... citizen journalists along with professional journalists yes. working and together. Together as equals. And, uh, you know, true citizen journalism has produced some interesting things now and then, but it always hits a wall. There's a lot that you can't really do uh, as, a, as a thoughtful person of goodwill sitting at home, uh, working in your spare time. You can't drop everything and chase a story for three days and things like that. Uh, at the same time, we know that there's a lot that thoughtful people can contribute. And in the past, the structure of most news sites hasn't really done anything useful to bring a community. The, the classic, you know, news community is here's the news article and at the bottom are the most horrible people in the world screaming at each other. Uh, and a lot of journalists are actually afraid of the community because of that, mm. uh, because their experience has been, I published something and I got all this abuse in the comments. Right. And that's not healthy. And that, those, those people, those angry people in the comments, don't represent the whole of humanity. All right, let's go to the audience again and get a question from Zunaid Ahmed Palak, Minister for Information and Technology in Bangladesh. Your question, please. Um, I thank uh, to the distinguished panelists for your insightful discussion. So, uh, in my views, there are two tools to tackle the fake news. Uh, one is definitely tough regulation, and another is self-censorship. So, my question to the panel, so what would you suggest uh, for a country like Bangladesh, although there is a strong argument from the government to regulate the fake news, but it okay. can actually damage the freedom of speech or freedom of All right. uh, press. Model. Thank you. I mean, we've seen, I mean, in fact, uh, Downing Street, the United Kingdom, British government has just announced a new unit to rebut fake news and we know that France and Germany have actually brought in regulations, Germany in particular, with very, very heavy fines if you're found to be perpetrating fake news. So there are some examples there of government regulation, but below Will Buta, let me put it to you, you've got to strike that right balance between regulation, hate speech Absolutely. versus free speech. I mean, I uh, look forward to seeing how uh, this goes forward, forward in a country like Germany that is so careful uh, in protecting freedom of speech and fundamental rights. And it will be an interesting place to see how this, uh, this sort of regulation goes forward. Same with France. But just with the minister from Bangladesh, my gut reaction is the fear of uh, undermining freedom of the press, especially in young democracies like ours, uh, with the tendency to authoritarianism. And why I much prefer and I'm really excited about the idea of things like uh, Wiki Tribune, because a lot of citizen journalists in Pakistan, that would, that would allow sort of credibility and authenticity and help with the training. Uh, I like also this um, Africa check and uh, it's the Ukrainian one, Stop Fake, mm -hmm. where journalists have got together. These are, this is sort of this traditional uh, politifact angle of uh, of checking uh, fake news. Perhaps this will develop into a more community uh, uh, driven. So you want the grassroots to kind uh, of I'm police more, I'm more fake news rather than, than governments I, doing I would it. say I, I, I'm more um, comfortable with something uh, like that. You think like that's that. enough, though? I mean, for example, well, you've got elections in Pakistan absolutely. this year, and you know, and I'm sure, but we, we've, we've historically been. Uh, dealing with fake news in uh, election cycles. Bangladesh and Pakistan dealt with fake, new, uh, fake news uh, even back then. So we've, uh, we, it, it is, there, there is that component, but I personally do not trust my state to be regulating really? this. But when you've got really detrimental effects and harmful consequences of fake news in your part of the world where it can result in death. No, absolutely. Don't absolutely. you need a heavier hand than so, just grassroots policing? Uh, no, absolutely grassroots policing on its own. Well, one important component I think that we're not addressing is education. I think we need to relook how we're teaching our kids in school. I don't remember being taught about journalism in high school or anything. You'd have taken an elective at, at university. If you're taught about sourcing, if you're taught about bias, if you're taught about how to uh, research and check multiple angles and see, and also taught what does fake news look like right. from, from from I think education is a really strong component another, another 
another uh, in, tool. In countering. Yeah, I'll come to Annabel Keener on this issue of um, hate speech versus free speech and the role of government in regulating fake news. Well, um, a lot of um, traditional news platforms, such as the press, such as TV broadcasters, are already uh, pretty thoroughly regulated in all the countries where we operate. This is true for RT, it's true for the BBC. And there, I most certainly don't think that additional regulation is the answer. But speaking uh, as a member of the media community, I think that a lot of the solution lies uh, with the news media community and holding each other accountable. Now, this is impo this is not something that is viable if, uh, when when Donald Trump accuses somebody of fake news, the media takes it as, as, as the badge of honor, but uh, President Macron does the same thing, and it's not even examined. That can only exist without these kinds of double standards, without lumping some editorial mistakes as dismissal of fake news of entire organizations and excusing repeatedly mistakes of others. But if there is a real, honest, open approach and examination when mistakes uh, that RT makes can be pointed out in a constructive debate by the likes of the New York Times, but RT is in a position to point out mistakes in the New York Times reporting, that is the most constructive approach that I see. Joe Cohn? You know, both, both the United States under President Trump and the Russian government under Vladimir Putin have actually taken upon the political leadership to some extent to combat what they call fake news, which I think is emblematic of the risk of having the state get involved in policing this. The Russian foreign ministry has a stamp, a big red stamp that they, that they put on pieces of news that they consider fake. Donald Trump has his fake news awards. These are not the people that we, the broader community, should be looking to to tell us what's accurate and what's not accurate in the news media. I think that is a very slippery slope to authoritarian sense. So no government regulation. I would say that I have very little to no faith in government regulation as a way of ferreting out fake news. The only thing that's really going to work with fake news is more quality news, more attention to quality news, uh, better traction for quality news on online platforms, and ultimately simply more information that's out there to combat the maliciously fake. So it's a shot in the arm for things like the New York Times, which is why your circulation has gone up, you think, because people think... Uh, been I around think since the mid-19th century. some people are to reliable brands, yep. and I think it's reaffirmed in the kind of social media age the value of true original reporting. Uh, and, and, and over time, we just have to continue to re-emphasize that. Jimmy Wales? Yeah, I think in, particularly in, in countries where there, there are fragile democracies or there's um, a lot of potential problems with uh, pressure from the state on publishers, uh, strong regulation is an incredibly dangerous and incredibly bad idea. Uh, I also don't think self-censorship is the answer. I don't even know what self-censorship means. I, don't th I think that's a completely false dichotomy. I think what we need is, is a robust ecosystem. Uh, you need to have the independence of journalism to speak truth to power, but also to ferret out fake news and to, and to speak truth about that. So, Minister, you've got some good answers there. You go back to your ministry and you've got your blueprint there to work out with your civil servants. Let's take our final question from the audience. Victor Ochen, a youth activist from uh, Uganda. Your question, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm from Africa, probably the biggest victim of fake news. What I wanted to ask is, uh, in a continent like Africa, where across the countries, there's that strong tribal loyalties to politicians to the point that it does not necessarily mean citizens are questioning whether the news coming from their leaders are fake or true. Mm -hmm. I'm asking, in such narratives, how can you enforce change in cultural norms of that kind? Thank you. Joe Khan, I think it was you who said earlier on that people will seek out opinions that reflect their own values and so on. So in the context of Africa and that question where people have tribal loyalties, yes. How can you try to... Um... I don't think it's only Africa where people have tribal loyalties. I mean, I, th yeah. I think it, it's well, a general... Well, since he put it in the context of Africa, OK. But, I mean, the, the question but is, I, how I can you bring a, about a I think it's a generalised change. problem that's, okay. that's getting worse, which is the hyper-partisanship of politics and news media debate. I mean, I think, basically, the idea of non-partisan facts, uh, even science, is itself being questioned or subordinated to partisan politics. You will believe what I, your political leader or spokesman, say you ought to believe mm -hmm. about climate change, about the performance of the economy, about what's happening in your own community, about the threat from immigrants. 
the, the idea of having a truly independent, fact-based for democratic discussion has been eroded in recent so years. So that tribal loyalty is a real fertile breeding ground. It's becoming more rather, than, more rather than less important. And that, to me, is an enormous dilemma for mainstream media, which is not by its nature partisan. So we cannot, by our nature, truly satisfy the demand for that kind of, you know, tribal affiliation. Is that with the, the case? News, we know lots of newspapers. Based. I mean, in the United Kingdom, you've got the Daily Telegraph, which is referred to as the Daily Tory Graph. That's the Conservative Party. But if we go in that the direction, if the Guardian is BBC more pro goes, if, if Wikipedia yeah. or Wiki Tribune go in that direction, we will have such a sharp deterioration. But in they the... don't peddle fake news anyway. But, I think, I think yeah. what's important here is that, yes, people, people do like to buy the Guardian, for example, if it confirms their worldview and so on, and that's That's fine. a left of centre newspaper left in the United newspaper Kingdom. In the UK. Yeah. Um, or they buy the Telegraph, and, th and that's fine. But I, I find, you know, Wikipedia is incredibly popular, New York Times incredibly popular, BBC News incredibly popular. People, people get that, and they, they also really do have a strong desire for clear facts, clear, so, unambiguous, as neutral as possible facts. We're coming to the end of time. I mean, it's basically the echo chamber and, and its effect on fake news. So Annabelle Keenan and then Bilal Wilbuto. Annabelle Keenan? Sure, I think the solution is diversity of stories, a diversity of points of view when reflected in legitimate, accountable, credible reporting. That is what RT seeks to deliver. And exploring news and topics and issues outside within the US, for example, outside of the partisan divide, as a way of providing the audience with the widest range of legitimate news stories possible. Below one. I think raising this partisan tribalism mm -hmm. issues is really, really important. I think internationally, uh, partisanship has gotten so toxic that that's probably a more fundamental threat to our democracy. But I wonder how President Trump, by engaging in these awards, are sort of rounding out uh, and painting as partisan uh, the the previously seen as objective news organizations by, by sort of engaging and hitting yeah. you in a politically partisan manner, well, almost yes. forcing them to react in the same way. All right, just very quickly to all of you, fake news, however imperfect a phrase might be, you think it's still going to be around, that we're not going to find a way of combating it? Yes or no? Annabel Kina, is it going to be around? Yes, but not for much longer. I think we're all starting to find, to see the issues with it. Jimmy Wells? I think the, the true fake news uh, spammy websites generated by teenagers will be algorithmically sorted out, um, you know, by Google and Facebook and everyone else. The deeper problem of uh, financial problems in the news media, low quality media, we've still got a lot to deal with. Below would be been around for ages, going to be around for a lot longer. I just hope we educate ourselves and empower our citizens to uh, deal with this Joe challenge. Khan. Actual fake news is on the decline. Uh, the fake news as a political smear is on the increase. Uh, that's the threat at the moment. Well, got to leave it there. Thanks very much indeed to my panel. Thank you to my audience here at the World Economic Forum. From me, Zainab Badawi, and all the team on our world debate, goodbye. <laughs>